window. Can you hear me now? Yes, marvelous. All right, thank you. All right. So, uh, thank you for um, the New Year te technical difficulties. Uh, I hope everyone had a good break. The year is moving fast and furious, and we're just going to get ahead, go ahead and get started and make the time, uh, use our time well. So, as you know, this is our implementation series, and today we are talking about the initial identification. Uh, I'm glad everyone actually found the web link, because I've tried to make sure that all of them are posted, and actually I need to update that one. Did not do that. All right. um, so, as you know, we broke up identification into four parts. Uh, the last time we just talked about those things in policy. Today we'll talk about initial identification, and I've got a couple of guests that will be talking and sharing with us. And then next time is kindergarten. Uh, if you have questions or you have some concerns, send those in and uh, Actually, if you want to talk about your process in your district, please let me know. Uh, I am willing and open for anyone who likes to share. To uh, I think this is a good open platform for that to do. And so we, and then the final one on identification and assessment, we'll be talking about your selection committee and those other kind of outliers that we have in this section of the student assessment. And then we will get into, then that will be into February, and then we'll look at March. But the web links for the Zoom meetings up till February are, are posted. So the next three are posted in the, on the website for you to find and peruse. So uh, we we'll get started. And so these are our next dates. Uh, so the ones that are posted after today is 2-4, 2-18. I will uh, work on posting March uh, and April in the next coming days. And then actually probably wrap us up to the end of the month and then updating today's when that this recording is available and when the uh, everything else is made accessible. So those will be up pretty soon. Um, and then we'll talk about looking at the next steps of this series and where we're going from there. So once again, getting into identification and assessment. So we need to, and we're really looking at, looking at those procedures that allow students to demonstrate or develop their diverse talents and abilities. So what are you doing to identify? What are your procedures they're using, that you're using in your districts for identification and assessment, how we're looking at that. Uh, so with this student assessment, as you know, we, you're looking at your identification process. We're gonna also talk about some of those informational sessions you should have uh, occurred, uh, knowing that we changed our language from nomination to referral, and then are you allowing for student exceptionalities and how are you doing that? Uh, as we go forward. And so as you got questions, uh, we'll go from there. Uh, these slides will be up and probably by the next, by the end of the day after we're finished with that, uh, I always put them up after I made them accessible um, so that you all can have a share of these. And our first guest, and let me make sure I can pull them up and to add them on to our, to talk about their assessment process is Dallas ISD. And where is the Dallas ISD people? If you will unmute yourselves, and then if you want, I will share your screen. Courtney, there we go. Okay, I think we're unmuted. And I'm gonna make you a co-host, yes. So if you want, if you have anything to share on your screen, if you want to share, uh, you can. Okay. Um, well, first, I'm Courtney Baruti. I am with Dallas ISD as one of the GT coordinators. And I'm Katrina Cord. 
also one of the DT coordinators for Dallas ISD. Um, I'm going to share with you guys a identification summary that we use with our teachers, I think. Monica, how do I share my screen? Uh, make your co-host, so if the bottom, do you have a, a share button? Uh, um, share again. Oh, I see it. Okay. Okay. So let me take off. Uh, hold on. Wrong computer. Okay. I'm using multiple devices today. That's fine. <sighs> Okay, so I believe I have it shared. Can you see it? Let me make share. Um, let's see. Give me one minute. So let's pause, see if you can do it now since I paused my share. But if not, if you want to email it to me right quick and then I can post it. Yeah, let me do that for you. All right. Uh, so I guess we can start talking about it. If Is that what you want? Um, the first thing when Katrina and I started about two years ago, I think, mm -hmm. um, was we saw where we needed to make changes to where we're allowing more areas for identification because previously our students were only identified in ability and achievement and creativity. And with the new state plan, um, we saw that, you know, there were areas for improvement. So now we've opened it up to um, students can be identified through achievement, ability, motivation, or leadership, creativity. We also incorporate a parent checklist. And then um, we have a work sample for those students that aren't in the district when they take STAR or Terra Nova or in the state, which is kind of rare, but they do happen occasionally. Um, we start the process actually with, um, we have nomination and I'm getting a little feedback from someone. Um, yeah, okay. Um, we have the those, and during this time, our the nominations are definitely they're open for you know anyone who want to who wants to nominate a child for identification, as well as we also have the automatic nominations, and those are based on the state assessment scores. Um, after the nomination window um, ends we give the NNAT 3 assessment and that is for this assessment is for ability as well as we have we do the GRS which is the gifted rating scale and that's where the teacher can um, fill out the areas of leadership and motivation for the student. We also um, send a parent checklist so the parent will have input on the student as well. You know, after that process, you know, we have a GT trained selection committee to make the final decision on whether students will or will not get into the program. But it's based on the guidelines that we, you know, already say it's pretty cut and dry. It's not a lot of wrong, wrong area, er, error or bias. Okay, uh, Trina and Courtney. Can you repeat the areas you identify against as a question from the chat? Yes, so we identify um, or we look for um, achievement. So we use the STAR Terra Nova for that piece. 
Um, for the ability area, we use the NAT3. Previously, we used the Sages. Um, for, we also do leadership or motivation, and it's um, the teachers will choose the highest score of the two. And we use the GRS, that gifted rating scale that Katrina was speaking about, which is the online rating scale to identify those two areas. Um, we also use the for and then we have our parent checklist to include the parents on their identification. And I'm about to post this in the chat so you guys can see. And I just emailed you our identification summary so you can see all the areas. Popping it open now. And we only require that student um, achieve three areas out of all of those. Mm -hmm. Oh, there it is. So this is the form that our teachers complete. Um, this is for first through fifth grade. We have an additional one for kindergarten. Um, but as you can see, we have target scores that as a district we recommend. And then um, we also allow campuses to adjust their depending on um, their campus needs. And that is based on the margin of error within each assessment. And I can send you our kindergarten one as well. Do you guys have any questions or need more clarity? So you got a question about the campus score? Okay, well, with the assessment, there is a um, margin of error. So um, we obviously want to acknowledge that margin of error and when choosing the scores, but we give campuses the flexibility, you know, because certain campuses may have a certain population or certain needs where they feel like they may adjust the score just a little bit in order for you know the campus to be successful based on the needs of the particular campus um we don't allow it to be just done you know in excess but we do know that we want to you know pro provide that access for all campuses so we give them a little of that wiggle room while also in the margin of error because for certain tests you know, the score may be a 90, but the margin of error may be 5% or 10%. So we allow, we open that up for campuses to look into that when they're making their decision. But we only do it in certain areas. As you can see, um, the areas on the identification summary where it's white, um, that's where you can adjust campuses. But as far as the achievement um, area and the parent checklist and the alternate to alternate assistance area, we don't allow for those types of adjustments. Yes, we do accept both the parent and the GRS as two qualifiers. The GRS is the parent. Yeah, right here. You see both the parents. Mm -hmm. Okay. The GRS is a normed rating scale, which there's very few like recently normed rating scales out there. Um, so we do know that there is validity to the rating scale. Um, but if students get two out of three qualifiers, then what happens is they're not, they're not in the program yet. 
they qualify for what we call a second opportunity assessment. And during this time, they, um, they take the torrents. So they're actually about to take the torrents next week. And then um, if they qualify in the torrent, then they would be placed into our program. But those two out of three qualifiers don't, or the parent and the, the GRS, they still have to qualify in an additional assessment before they can be into our program. The alternate uh, assessment. Okay, the alternate assessment. We have that for those students who um, who don't who don't have achievement score for whatever reason. Maybe they come from out of state. Maybe they didn't take the um, the state assessment for whatever reason. So we allow we have alternate to give those students just so we can get a better picture. So they'll have the same amount of areas. Because if we, you know, if a student came without an achievement score, that would take their their qualifying area down. So if we wanted to kind of supplement that area with an altern uh, with the alternate assessment. They only take that alternate assessment if they don't have an achievement score. Um, yeah, so students that, that are in the district, if they transfer from school to school, um, they're automatically for services. If they come from out of our district, we ask that our teachers send us um, their test scores and then we meet as a committee to decide if that's the best place for the student to be or not. Mm -hmm. If they're, if it's comfortable. How do you start with your students in each of these areas? Oh, so honestly, TPSP. TPSP has the ability for our teachers to meet the needs of all of our students, no matter if they qualify in motivation or leadership or creativity. Um, it's such a great curriculum where our teachers can modify and adjust and differentiate how they need to. Mm -hmm. And all of the units pretty much choose a unit based on any, you know, area. Um, because as I'm looking right now, I see leaders units that we have for leadership ability. So yes, that TPSP is a very good place to choose curriculum to meet those needs of the area. Any more questions? All right, ladies, thank you. I am going to shit, go back. All right, thank you. Thank you, and you guys can email us if you have any other questions. All right. And let's So I want to thank Port, uh, Dallas ISD for sharing today. We got another share in a few minutes. Um, I'm slowly rolling, but uh, as it rolls, uh, I want to say once again, thank you for sharing. And if you don't, uh, here are their email addresses. If you have questions, um, can y'all see the slides? Because I'm really wondering, because right now it just feels weird to me because I can't see it on my laptop. Um, but as we go forward, uh, we will share. And if Dallas ISD is okay with sharing that document, I will put that out there for you to look at also. Uh, but as we move forward, just remember, uh, talk about the communication, because making sure your parents, your
your community, your staff know about the process, at least the initial stage when your referral process is, uh, who to contact. Um, those are the, some of the key things at this point that you have to remember uh, that they have issues with uh, or be the first thing they'll call you on the carpet for is making sure that you are uh, Make sure everything is good. All right, going to the next one. Uh, and then once again, communication with families. Knowing what is your process on how are you providing, if you do parent checklists, those documentations, how that's going out uh, to your parents, what's coming in from uh, within the teachers who, uh, who at the campus receives the documents or things of that sort, how is that working? So when you look at that, how does that uh, fall, fall into place? And making sure everyone knows in the correct language, I know in the state of Texas, that's, that's a challenge uh, for some of us, especially with some of our, you know, we pretty much have English and Spanish, some of us have Vietnamese, but then you got the Eve, you got the Burma, you know, the things out there, the, the smaller ones that, you know, we don't have too much of, but we got, so look, knowing how you're going to communicate that out. Um, the ongoing identification. Um, think about how you do this. It's not necessarily saying we're going to have ongoing uh, identification year round. That's a local district decision. But do you have procedures in place to say if your, t your uh, nomination process is in October, that a teacher after seeing a student all year long can still refer someone or to say, this is someone you need to look at for next year. So what are your think, thoughts on that? And how do you work that out? So that that new teacher coming, when they walk into that new class and you only got August, September, and then you're testing in October, how are they seeing these students? So looking at just not beyond that little small window, how do we look at students uh, in your ongoing identification? And then opportunities for says we've been talking about this one. So just know that they have to have at least once a year opportunity uh, for assessment. Um, you are the controller of your assessment opportunities, but they have to be available to your students. assessed in language or they understand or with nonverbal uh, assessments. And I think most of you are using some form or some piece of a nonverbal assessment uh, to make sure that you are bringing in those students and that they have access to assessment. And within that access, when you start thinking of our special pops and you start thinking of our SPED students, uh, making sure you working with your vendors or knowing the parameters of what accommodations, modifications you can make to a test. If you can give extra time, if you can put a, a color overlay over it, or if you can actually read it to someone, what are your parameters to still make sure that your results are valid once that test is given. And so uh, one of the things that uh, I'm working on this year is also if you pay, uh, there's two different versions of it, but we have a list of assessments out there and making sure that they are up to date. Uh, so that's one of the goals for this year is to update that assessment list uh, with the validity, reliability, and uh, any other things that those publishers want to include on their documentation for those assessments. So that is one thing that we will build, we're building out. And then finally, if they have access uh, or if they have been assessed, excuse me, and identified, and then how do you serve? So make sure that we're looking at their provided services. So I think that's going to be the key question and the concern where if you're assessing in October, when do they start identification? If you're assessing in January or February, when do they start a, a identification? And making sure, going back to talking about that uh, communication, so if a kid is assessed in January, your results come out in March, are you serving in April and May? Or is it for the following year? 
So making it clear on when do your, your uh, services start upon whatever period of testing that you're working with. Uh, looking at that and making sure that is very clear to parents. And then if you are providing services in the areas of leadership, uh, the arts, creativity, that you have those same criteria uh, looking at those areas also as you move forward. So that is that one. So if someone asked the question, do you recommend sending actual assessment results to parents or just placement decisions? Um, actually, you can, for partners of the data, and we're getting into that. Uh, actually, you really can just look at sending out the placement decision. Um, if you have to remember, your results are really more uh, for you and your determination in that placement but they really want to know why were they placed. Now, when they come, they'll have that appeal process and that question, and when they come back in for that appeal, that might, that's where you can actually show that student's results on that assessment, on those assessments, and it might be just the profile sheet that you share with us. Um, and they can look at their actual test, but other than that, uh, I think you're very safe with just the placement decision, but that is, once again, a very local decision. Uh, as you go through. So when you look at how do you get to that placement, what are, making sure you have those multiple sources and that they are, that you allow for those exceptionalities once again, and then look at uh, making sure your selection committee has reviewed all of that information uh, before they make a decision on placement and it's not just a sign off that yes, this kid is moving into uh, a program or into services. And then once again, for our uh, grades one through 12, we're looking at qualitative and quantitative data. And at least are collected through three or more measures. So at least three measures, people, uh, that we're looking at when you're determining uh, placement and our services. But back again to our placement decision, making sure, and we'll talk about your selection committee a little bit more uh, down the line, but make sure that, we're, that they are reviewing the data, that they know what they're looking for, they know what your program services is all about, no matter if you're doing it at the district level or at the campus level, that they're, they're making the best decision for a student um, and when they're making that placement, and so that they need to be properly trained. Uh, and it might be, you might have to do a little tailored uh, training for your district to talk about the program services that you're having and the assessments that you use compared to the administrative training or the nature and needs that they've taken as a teacher within their 30 hours. So a couple of things to think about, but your placement committee really needs to be uh, very open and uh, non-biased and not... Uh, looking at all of the information, not just pieces, but all of the information so that they can make the best uh, decision for a student. Uh, I know some use a blind decision, so all they know is these are the results and go from there. Uh, but that is you as a local district also. So we'll talk about that. And so at this time, and I'm hoping this will work, uh, I have a couple of friends from Pearland ISD that are here with me, Margo, with, uh, Gigi, Gigi, I, I think I still messed it up, and Robin Olson, and they will be talking about their program services. All right. Who's first, ladies? Uh, I'll go first, then Robin tell you all the details. Okay. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So, um, I had this aha moment uh, several years ago when I, I was new to this position that we were essentially, you know, identifying linebackers and saying, go out there and play shortstop. And our identification uh, system did not match our program services. And the program services are like uh, many districts in the um, in Texas where it's primarily academics. And so all these tests on creativity really didn't fit. And so I started looking at how to assess differently. And uh, 
I think Dallas has used a universal screener. I've heard that on some of the L webinars too. But the universal screener was um, my second aha moment when um, we actually looked at how many students were identified who were referred by parents and how many we found just from the advanced academics office. And at, at that time, 69.7% of all of our second grade students were identified from our universal screener, not from parent or teacher referrals. And it was interesting too that 100% of our free and reduced lunch students came from the universal screener and um, the departments off in the office rather than anybody, and they were not even referred for assessment. So um, it kind of was an aha moment for me that you can't just rely on referrals and test only those students. You've got to look for that buried treasure and be very intentional about that. So uh, we use different universal screeners each year, different assessments each year, because there are some parents in our, in our community who have uh, GT study groups and they'll study for a year and a half, meet once or twice a week, they go to testing moms, they download all the assessments. So we do try to mix it up frequently because it's not fair to the kids who don't have that kind of parent or access. So um, with the universal screener, uh, Robin and I will look at every student's scores and then we take uh, particular care with our students who are in a targeted population, free lunch, reduced lunch, um, a Hispanic or English learner, special education. And if any of those things are indicated, we look and say, is there any hint of any kind of um, ability here? And if we find some suggested uh, ability, we have a closet full of assessments and we'll go back and give additional assessments. We don't, we don't just take a different score level. We don't uh, give people extra points. We just go do more testing. And we've, we've found a lot of our, our targeted populations by just giving them a different type of test than what was administered um, to the large group as a universal screener. I think Dallas ISD mentioned that second opportunity. And um, anyone, we don't restrict that at all. Anyone who looks like they have some indication and there's a, especially a targeted area that we're looking for will do additional assessment. So um, the other thing that helped with our um, our identification of uh, our diverse populations was to look at data over time. Um, if you look at just what they're doing in second grade and their scores, do they meet criteria, yes or no, they're either in or they're out. And then the same student is referred in third grade or in fourth grade and it's like, oh, so close every year. And when we stop looking at just this one year on a lateral uh, level and then looking at What's the data over time? Is this student scoring high in this one area repeatedly? And then um, we found uh, some students there, and particularly our English learners, even especially those who are not in a bilingual program because their parents just didn't think they needed it. They just put them in an English immersive experience and the verbal score would be low, and then the next year would be a little higher, the next year will be higher, but still far lower than what we'd expect. And so when we looked at the other patterns over time, we found some of those students. Um, Monica said something about training personnel. We used uh, Bernie Kingor's planned experiences in kindergarten through fourth grade for a number of years with some reasonable success when we trained them every year. And since the classroom teacher throughout the district in all K through four was the person on the front line giving those, uh, administering those assessments, um, we train them and, and when we and then they got to the point well we got this we don't need training anymore well uh, Robin did a study just over the last two years and said hey this is not working for us at all and so there is when we didn't train every year and retrain on how to administer that planned experience and, and encourage students to do their best then we saw a, a it didn't just drop off, it just went through the, through the cellar. Like there were no kids doing quality work on that planned experience. And so um, we're going back to that. And, and so whatever assessment is being given, if that person has to be trained, it's not just the identification committee, it's any person who associated with the assessment. And so that was another thing that I think we've noticed. Um, also, making sure your bilingual, dual language, uh, and special education teachers have an opportunity to learn about identification and assessment for gifted. 
So it's not uncommon now for our, our bilingual teachers, our dual language teachers, and then some of our special ed teachers to say, hey, I've, I, I've had some uh, LSPs come and say, hey, I've, I tested this kid for this, this learning difference, but I think he's gifted too, and to share that, begin to share that data with us. So um, the fourth thing we're looking at is establishing local norms. It's complicated if your campuses are not equitable in their performance, academic performance, and then they go to a middle school situation where they're expected to all be performing at the same level. So um, looking at, we're, we're look, looking at that, it's not perfected yet. So when we figure that out, I'll let you know. Um, we are also beginning to identify by single subject and finding more kids that way. And Robin's done a wonderful job of streamlining our process and putting that online. And on that on, online referral form, there's a place that says, you know, ask the parents, does your student need uh, special testing accommodations? And uh, whether the student is special education or 504 or is in the process, if the student has, if the teacher or anyone in the school is aware that the student might have a special learning difference, then uh, you can provide accommodations. I got that from our legal counsel. And so if we have a student with uh, real or perceived accommodations needed, then we test one-on-one -on -one and with someone who's highly trained and how to do that. And we do check with, um, our providers on what accommodations can be allowed and pretty much it, you can do just about anything if you've got a legitimate reason and documentation to support that. But we have a form uh, where the test, the test administrator completes an anecdotal record, writes down the time, the behaviors of the students, the participation and, and everything that the student is doing and the accommodations that were provided. So that would, if it does come to appeal, we have the documentation to say, yes, the student was given 50% extra time, uh, the student was off task, so we took a walk, took frequent breaks, and we can actually say that the accommodations were provided. So that's helped a lot with um, our uh, second, our appeal, first and second uh, appeal levels. Okay, and then um, the other other thing that we're doing is we're exploring new arenas for services. Um, uh, Monica, don't laugh. Uh, we've had these conversations uh, already. We're looking not just at single subject, but looking at leadership and uh, our fine arts director is considering what would it take to provide a, a, a GT program for vocal um, performance, for vocal music. And then we had a question from our CTE department about welding. So um, if we're going to identify um, GT CTE welding, we need to and we establish identification criteria and uh, provide a service that is truly different for that talented welder. So uh, we don't say no, we say, well, let's talk about what that means. And so as we further that conversation, I'm not sure that's going forward. So Robin's got all the details in the process. Again, she's been very, uh, very good at making things more efficient. And we do have a closet full of assessments. If we find a student that we think might be gifted, and just not quite there, we just go back and do additional assessments. And we have a minimum of four, sometimes as much as 10 or 12 pieces of data before we make a decision. Okay, Robin, it's all yours. Okay, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, my name is Robin Olson. I'm the K-4 specialist here in Pearland ISD. Um, as Margot said, we definitely um, are trying to start identifying in single subject areas, but typically we um, identify in general intellect ability. Um, I'm gonna go over just our process and how that looks. So the first thing that we do is we have those parent meetings um, that start in August. We had two in August this year. They're typically geared towards the elementary parents or parents that are new to the district and looking to identify. Um, the timeline is published to the parents, it's emailed to the parents, and then we also put out a poster um, letting parents know when the identification um, meetings, like the um, parent awareness meeting is, and then also how to identify, how to put that referral into the Skyward system. And those are at all K through A campuses. Uh, our referral process is a little more streamlined now. We do everything through Skyward. We have an online form in Skyward that the parents complete. That form is open through September 30th of every school year. It usually starts right around the first day of school. We take referrals from parents, 
teachers, campus staff, et cetera, the majority of our referrals are from parents. And then if a um, teacher or someone from campus wants to refer, then they have to contact me. I contact the parent and have the parent fill that form out. Through our referral um, that is through Skyward, one of the pages is the qualitative data, which is that Kingor observation inventory form. So instead of having to send a separate form to the parents after referring, it's part of the actual referral process. The form that the parents fill out, the um, Kangaroo observation inventory is also the same form that the teachers fill out. And then we take an average of those two to get that qualitative score. Um, also in K through two, we do do planned experiences still through the second grade level. Um, after the second grade level, we stopped doing it as Margo said, because we saw that there was a decline in the products that we were getting. But we were thinking of maybe starting that again and starting to train the teachers again so they can um, start implementing those and get a little better quality of, um, of product. All students, regardless of referral, in grades K through four, the um, teachers complete the, obser the Kinger observation inventory on each student. So we're getting um, all of those Kinger observation inventories on kindergarten students, plus those planned experiences. So that's what we use when we're doing the um, consideration for all kindergarten students. We look at their planned experiences and their observation inventory. Plus, if we have a student who's had a observation inventory completed by the teacher, but has not been referred, we can still use that to contact the parents and say, hey, you might want to think about going ahead and completing the referral for, <laughs> for, the, um, for the student. As far as assessment, again, we are looking at general intellect ability. At the um, K through second grade level, we're looking for scores um, in ability only. And then third grade through 12th grade, we're looking for ability and assessment scores. Our assessment um, piece, we used to test on campus. Um, we don't have specialists on campus in every campus in Pearland ISD. So it's just the people that work out of our office. We have one elementary, 258, 2912, and then we also have a coordinator who assists with all of us. So we streamlined the process and now we do our testing on Saturdays for K for K4. F58 does theirs um, on campus still to this day. And then 912, they typically do theirs here after school in the first semester. So as I said, we do our testing on Saturdays here. We start um, on the weekends starting in October with those third and fourth grade students. We do have a GT Academy. So we try to do third and fourth grade first in order to get their results and, dis and decisions out first and start doing the appeal process before we start doing the little people. Um, kindergarten and first grade, we just um, started in January. So we do those in January and February. And again, that's here on the weekends. We typically have a morning session and an afternoon session. Um, how, we get, how we get proctors for that is we typically have teachers that volunteer and they earn flex days. And then through those flex days, they're able to take off during teacher work days that are um, designated by the district. Um, by doing this in, um, on Saturdays, doing all of our testing and not pulling kids out of, out of their um, classroom during the day, they lose less instructional time and then they also, um, we can also move a lot more kids through. So where it would have taken a couple months, many weeks to test um, the hundreds of students in third and fourth grade, we can now do in just a couple of Saturdays, which is really easier. Um, the, we, we tested on January 11th, and we, I think we had about 150 to 160 students test in one day. And those are all paper tests. We do, um, we do our, those tests here at the ESC, and then we hand score and norm them. So again, third and fourth grade starts in the fall. Um, and the way we communicate all of this with parents, um, emails are sent to parents to schedule a testing day. So they get to choose their testing day. They get a sign up genius email and then they choose their testing day and time. <clears throat> we have several parents who, who do reschedule. It's not enough to, um, to change the process, but they do pick a date that and time that works for them. Um, second grade, we do do the COGAT full battery as a screener. So everyone in the district who's in second grade is considered and does take the full battery COGAT. Again, as Margo was saying, we do um, review those scores when they come in. They've started testing this month and that continues through February. And then once all 11 schools are done, we'll go ahead and review those results. 
Um, let's see. So as far as identification, we do do a committee of district personnel. So we do three people in our office that um, have, have their um, hours and everything. And then we look at all information. So not just their testing from this year, we'll also look at anything that they have. If they brought outside testing, which a lot of parents do, they do outside testing. Um, if they have any kind of data from previous schools or anything, we look at everything. And we have a huge spreadsheet and, and try to look at everything and err on the side of the student more than anything. Um, if a student, once we decide if a student makes it in, um, the letters are sent from our office to the parents. Um, typically, we start we start um, serving the next school year, but Monica was here last week and visited with our district, and that is something that we're going to have to look at revising for um, for the future and starting to serve as soon as we are identified. Our appeal process is is also a, a form that's online. It's on our website. Parents fill out the form send the form to their current grade level specialist. And then we schedule a meeting, which is with someone from our department and then also with the campus principal and typically the assistant principal or the counselor. Um, in an effort to, to try to identify those, um, those students from low SES campuses, we have been working um, with a, a push-in type model where we go in to the classrooms and just kind of visit. Visit, do observation, take anecdotal notes and see what's going on in those classes and who stands out. Um, teachers um, from those campuses have also been providing us with a list of students um, that they see GT characteristics in that they may not have seen in the beginning of the year when they had to fill out that observation inventory, but maybe that are sticking out to them now. We've also discussed possibly um, doing um, an email to all 11 of our campuses in the future for elementary, asking those um, administrators and teachers, you know, who stuck out to you this school year? Who do you think has those gifted characteristics and just wasn't referred this year? So we can contact the parent, have them refer for next year or put them on our radar to do observations for next year. I think that's about it. I know Margo talked about our different assessments that we use. We typically use COGAP, but we have Nagliari, Olsat, Slauson, again, a whole closet full of assessments. Um, and then we do the, the qualitative data, which is the Kangor observation inventory and the Kangor planned experiences. That is all. Thank you, ladies. Uh, Margo, anything last uh, for walk away? Y'all got it covered. So um, thank you. And we have a few questions in the chat, but I think uh, the rest of your staff answered those as you uh, went through. Um, but I, and the reason why I ask for people to share, uh, because they are, you are the working experts in this, uh, in the process and how you're using these assessments. And so um, please take the time to reach out to them. I will also update the, uh, Paralyn slide with their email addresses. So if you have questions, you can reach out to them and then this will be available. Um, but as we go forward, also think about your district demographics. Uh, I just pulled a little snapshot from the enrollment trends, which you can get off of the TA website of how do we look uh, for ethnicity in 2019 within our special populations. So looking at how, uh, what does your numbers look like? And remember, we're looking at, we're doing a great job on doing the assessment and identifying these students, but then how are we still maintaining them in our services or our program services still meeting their needs? Because once you do these, uh, make these accommodations, these modifications to get them in, but your program is still the same. I don't know what's going on. Wow. Okay. It went there live too long on there. So this is the enrollment trends. I'm not sure if it's sharing it, but we'll go back. All right. And so if you just want to look at the numbers of how do we look as a state. So these are our ethnicity numbers in the state, uh, something I've been sharing recently and, you know, some good aha, good wonderings uh, to think about. As you go forward, what do our numbers look like? And I you know some of you have been looking at uh, 
go down to Ford formula uh, for equity and uh, uh, as you look into our program services. And so this is just a brief snapshot of what we would look like and how we look as a state uh, within comparing our GT numbers to the state and then what is actually happening. And this is still our 2018, 2019 numbers. Um, and then when we get further into one of our sessions, we'll talk about doing these data digs and going in and looking at how we're serving our student populations. All right, anyone have anything for, uh, they wanna share about what their program services? I know it's like 159, but where it's always an open window or open questions. I'd like to share something. Jennifer Leo from Rockwall. Thank you. Okay, so for kindergarten identification, we have been for the last six years. Okay, hold it, Jennifer. Okay. Would you like to share with kindergarten identification in, in our next session? Because that's the next one is kindergarten identification. Oh, put me on that, definitely. Gotcha. Bye. Okay, so I'm not going to talk now. I'll see you next time. All right, gotcha. You'll watch, I'll get an email, Jennifer, yay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Questions? Questions for the ladies while they're still on? Uh, or questions for me? We got Jennifer from Rockwell gonna talk about her kindergarten process. Anyone else wanna talk about their kindergarten process? That's February, set, uh, February the 4th is our next one at 9 a.m. Kindergarten. It's a new year. It's time to step out. All right, any questions? I think uh, there was one from the chat that I needed to. Uh, we kind of talked about this last uh, identification and process with furlough and probation. So furlough is that temporary leave of absence for a student, temporary. Your probation uh, is, pro is more of your process either to, for continuation of services or exiting from services. What is that student doing or not doing within your service programs? If they're, you know, if they're not performing, put them on probation, work the system, for them to be exited from your program services. If uh, they have an emotional, you know, someone died, family, a crisis going on, they need to leave from our uh, services, that's your furlough. Um, and, and I'm gonna just, you know, I always throw it out there because, you know, my, my mindset, and everyone does not agree with me on this one, but a furlough is not for scheduling conflicts, okay? Uh, it is really for those, you know, those students who need just a, a leave of absence from services. Uh, and, and so we're looking at, you know, how do you look at that compared to a furlough and what are you using your processes? Um, so, as, so as we finish out this year, uh, the question is uh, discussing informational meetings that need to be had. So your informational meetings, uh, We had what was that for today or the future? Uh, we could ask questions. You could ask questions about that. I think with the informational meetings, and we can also talk about how do you communicate your program services. Is basically what are you telling your parents about the program services, uh, about the testing process, um, and what are your windows? Uh, I think for when you're looking at the initial stages of for a referral process, that's what they want to know. What's, what's the time frame? Uh, time frame, when will services start if they are placed? Uh, and then what are you looking for? And then highlighting what are your program services. Always show off the best that you got so that they can see what their child will be a part of. But then being honest of, it, you know, if we do have strict, rigid, you know, Depending on your process and your your uh, criteria, there is a criteria, uh, and you need to know it's just not for everyone. And you will be progress. You will be monitoring that child's success at all points and looking for them to be involved. 
Uh, anyone else want to add on what they talk uh, include in their informational meetings, or would y'all like to have another session on just that? You know, I'm open. Y'all let me know. Okay. No other questions? All right. So that ends for today. And as I said, our next one is on February the 4th at 9 a.m. And it will be over a kinder, kinder, let me speak this afternoon, kindergarten assessment and identification. So uh, see you then. Everybody have a great day.